وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا ونبينا محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه واله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون صدق الله العظيم وبلغنا رسوله النبي الكريم ونحن على ذلك من الشاهدين Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has given us an example and inspiration and amongst the things that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam brought a couple that we can reflect on is one the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam of course restored to humanity, the notion of Tawheed, something that was slipping away, this message that was slipping away of the devotion and worship of one God. So he revived it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He brought it back to people who had forgotten about it, who had turned to idols, uh, who had turned away from morality, uh, who were burying their young newborn daughters alive. And all of that had to do with the, the moral decay at the root of it was, of which was uh, turning away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And going into uh, this uh, worldview and this faith and, and belief that was very superficial, very traditional, where people followed and did what their forefathers did. They worshipped idols because they found their forefathers did the same thing as the Quran says. But in reality, uh, it was all rituals. There was no meaning to religion. And so you see that the Prophet wasallam brings back the essence of faith. And reminds them that this worship and devotion, number one, it's not supposed to be ritualistic and for gatherings and for play. This is something that's serious. This has to be from the heart and it has to impact the heart. And so it wasn't just don't worship idols, don't worship multiple gods, worship one God. It's, it wasn't as simple as that. Beyond that, it was how you worship and what worship does to you. What is the meaning of this Tawheed of, uh, of Ibadah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what the Prophet والسلام, he revived. And this is something that if you reflect, those who don't believe in God, those who don't believe in God, by and large, the purpose of life and of existence becomes very trivial uh, and we become uh, very undignified and disrespected as human beings. As uh, they say, you know, you're just uh, carbon or you're just um, like well, one scientist who is an atheist said that we as humanity, we are like eczema on, on someone's skin. Like a human body or an animal's skin can have eczema. We're no more than that. And so... That's not the idea of humility that Islam teaches. Humility is one thing, to recognize your place when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's one thing. But to take away any purpose and meaning in, uh, from your life and make yourself worthless, that's the idea of not believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all a coincidence, we are here, out of just some sheer coincidence and there's no meaning and no rhyme and reason behind it. That is what the Prophet Sallallahu came to move away, to purify that state uh, and, and to bring us to the light of Iman and to bring humanity that light that illuminates the hearts, that gives meaning to life and that as a result reforms humanity, reforms the individual and the society where we become much more than the rest of 
uh, uh, the, the animal kingdom. We, we, we are set apart by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we are reminded that you are not. We have the capacity to, uh, to kind of uh, go down to that level of animals if we're not careful. And that's what the, the goal of wahi in revelation is, is to elevate us. So this kind of elevation is something that the Prophet ﷺ brought. He did that for us, ﷺ. He brought us the idea of, uh, of serving others. In, in a meaningful way, in a way that it's not a favor for someone, in a way that it's not just an extra thing you do, but as a part and parcel of who you are as a believer, to be at the service of others, to be open to others, and to consider others and to be considerate of others. That's what is the Prophet ﷺ reminded us, is part of who we are, it's part of our identity. If you don't have that, there is something very major lacking in your faith and your iman. So the Prophet ﷺ, he ennobled people. He وسلم, gave people digni dignity and respect and, and, and status to the point where uh, we know that here is a man who is the messenger of Allah and who is getting direct revelation from God. And he was commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to consult with the believers. Can you imagine? The doors of revelation are open. The channel is open with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he can wait at any moment to get instructions from Allah through wahi and revelation. That's, that's open as long as the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam uh, since the time he became a prophet until the last moments of his life, those doors were open. Yet, he consulted the companions, uh, Why did he do that? To dignify them, to elevate them, and to give them purpose in, in, in their lives, and to give them a, a, a dignity in their lives. And so, that is what the Prophet ﷺ brought. And what the Prophet ﷺ, uh, also brought to us was the idea of compassion and mercy. Again, not as, as something that you do on the side, but something that's central to his message. We have said this again and again, and it you know, deserves to be repeated every time. That uh, a central pillar of the message of the Prophet ﷺ. A central pillar of the tarbiyah, the way he raised and taught people of the Prophet ﷺ, was this idea of treating them with compassion and mercy. And we, all, we find all of this in the Qur'an. Right? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ It is out of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are kind and gentle and soft with these believers. If that wasn't to be the case, if you were not compassionate and merciful, if that wasn't the case with you, if you were not an embodiment of that mercy and compassion and kindness, then all of this would not have happened. They would not have gathered around you. They would have scattered away from you. And so through your mercy, through your kindness, through your generosity of, of spirit, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered the believers around you. And then in the same ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that uh, your compassion and you elevating them, giving them dignity, uh, uh, through, through your compassion is not enough. You have to go a step further so that they're not, they don't feel like, you know, like as if they're children and they're, you're just being kind and nice to them uh, to give them what they want and to, to, to uh, you know, make them to satisfy a need they have. No. Beyond that, the purpose and the goal here is to elevate them where you uh, bring them 
so high that you as the messenger of Allah, you ask for their opinion, for their feedback and for their input. وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ And so consult with them, with the companions uh, And if you uh, think about the ayat of the Qur'an that talk about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, he aided and he helped the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How the nasr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came. Huwa alladhi ayyadaka bi nasrih. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who helped you with, with his assistance. Right? Wa bil mu'mineen. His direct assistance of course, but also by means of the believers. And he gathered the believers around you, they became your, your soldiers, they became your students, they became your community builders. But how was that possible? How did Allah make that possible? Through the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Of course you were an example of compassion and, compa and, and, and mercy and generosity. But none of that is possible without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ Allah brought their hearts together. It is the mercy of Allah. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ That's the mercy of Allah. This is also a mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He brought the hearts of the believers together. لَوْ أَنْفَقْتَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا مَا أَلَّفْتَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ if you were to spend whatever is on this earth, all of the resources, all of the wealth of this world on this mission to unite people's hearts, you would not have been able to accomplish this. Because, of course, everything is in the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there is a very unique way in which the hearts are controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who you love, which way you incline, this is all in the hands, uh, and the hadith says, uh, between the two fingers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't take that literally, of course. It's the, in the control, the power of Allah, His majestic power is what controls the hearts. And so the fact that He, uh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was as an example, but Allah brought these hearts together, and that became the source of inspiration. That became the reason for the Muslims gaining the upper hand without any resources. Can you imagine this, uh, this community, this society who had nothing, who lived in the depths of darkness, who had nothing to offer humanity, nothing whatsoever. The best they, they had was poetry and prose. They didn't build anything. They didn't build any tools. They weren't manufacturers, they, they didn't have big castles, none of those. Yet, these people were empowered by the Prophet wasallam with uh, the, the kind of infrastructure that's not visible. The kind of power that's not visible. Their character, that's in their hearts, that is in their unity that is in their mutual love. And so that was the reason that the, uh, the Sahaba عنهم, were successful. And every time that was, uh, any of that was lacking, every time uh, that Iman and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and belief and conviction in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was a little bit deficient, Allah Azza wa Jalla immediately reminded the Prophet and the companions that something's lacking here. In Uhud, that's what happened. They didn't listen to the Prophet wasallam. The Sahaba didn't, and then they had to taste defeat. In in Hunayn as well, the, the companions radiyallahu anhum, if ajabat kum kathratukum, they looked at their big numbers and they became complacent and they said, the victory is ours. No one can defeat us. We are so big, and they were defeated. Two remind them that the real source of your uh, victory here is your unity, the fact that 
the, your, your Prophet والسلام, he gathers you with his compassion, with his mercy, with consulting with you, and he gives you power through your unity, through connecting you to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever any of that goes, your outward numbers and your resources, all of those, they become meaningless. They have no power and no impact. So that kind of a community, within less than a hundred years, were able to conquer one more than one third of the world. It's a miracle. You know, historians look at that as, as the, the miracle because it's nothing short of a miracle for that kind of, from, from, from such lows, from such having nothing to, to rising to that level of, of power in this world is only possible through a miraculous uh, upbringing and miraculous teaching and training of the Prophet Sallallahu And so if we look as an ummah, as individuals, as communities, today as at what's lacking, we can go back uh, to those ideals. We can go back and see that mutual compassion and mercy that the Prophet والسلام, taught us that's lacking in the Ummah today. That we, he told us that believers are like one body. When one limb is in pain, the rest of the body hurts. Is that the condition of the Ummah today? The unity, وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ Where is that unity of hearts of this Ummah? Where is that idea of inclusivity of bringing everyone together as the Prophet والسلام, did. And instead you have dictator after dictator after dictator in different parts of the Muslim world oppressing their own people. You see Bashar al-Assad, hundreds of thousands have died at his hand, right? He does that yet when his enemy attacks the uh, airports and destroys his infrastructure, no response, right? But he was very brave when it came to innocent Syrians that he was killing in the thousands. And that story repeats itself everywhere, where there's that lack of acceptance of your fellow Muslim brother or sister, right? In every single country, you see that, you find plenty of examples. In Afghanistan, this group that's in, in, in power today, they were trying to come together and join almost 20 years ago. But people at that time who were intoxicated by power, they refused. They were trying to come and reconcile and, and join uh, that uh, power structure. They were rejected because they thought they had the money, they had the backing of NATO and US and all of that. And those people had nothing, so therefore, even though they're their own people, reject them, turn them away. And then lo and behold, 20 years later, they take over. And now they're repeating that same mistake. You have been defeated. We kicked you out. We're not going to accept any of you. We have eliminated you. It's done for you. The same story repeats itself again and again. In Pakistan, the man that was in power a couple of years ago, now he's in jail, and the man that he put in jail is probably, you know, they're preparing to put him back in power. This uh, political game of musical chairs continues. And so this idea of accepting your fellow brothers and sisters in Islam is something that is the secret of, uh, of victory for this ummah. That's the secret and the recipe for our strength and for our progress. But that's what is, is missing and that's what we are uh, suffering from. And it's everywhere. Whether we're, you know, we have peaceful societies outwardly or whether we are in a state of, uh, of violence and conflict, whether we are under an occupation, we have various groups. They're duking it out. They're trying to expel and exclude the other. And so no wonder we are in the state that we are in. And if we want as an ummah, collectively or even as, as pockets, wherever we may be, that's the recipe. To go back to that 
mutual acceptance, that compassion, that bringing all together, not uh, considering everything as a zero-sum game. You look at Egypt, if those military leaders, if they had the foresight to bring everyone together, rather than uh, completely you know, eradicating half of the society, putting all of their leadership in jail and killing many of them, they did that. And, and they demolished and destroyed any opportunity for Egypt, for example, to be a, a great example of, a, of a, a Muslim society that's successful, that's democratic, that goes back to its people and the people decide who should be in power. Like Allah said, وَشَاوِرْهُمْ فِي الْأَمْرِ That's the modern day manifestation of asking people for their opinion. It's through these elections. And so it's very much possible to marry the, the two ideas of a modern progressive democracy, but at the same time uphold the values, the beautiful values of Islam. That wasn't possible with the military dictator. They couldn't take it, so they destroyed it. But then those people who, who won, who were Islamists, they also didn't have the foresight. They didn't realize that they don't own the entire country. They didn't realize that they only won by 51 to 49 percent. If they had the foresight and the wisdom to realize that 49 percent of the country didn't want them in power. But that's the rule, so they won. But they started acting like they own everything and they made all of the decisions unilaterally. And that was partially at least to blame for their downfall. And so when you go back to the Prophet Wasallam's example, it's mercy, it's mutual consultation, it is uh, preparing people and giving them uh, this inspiration for a higher purpose in their lives. That's what's lacking in the Ummah, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore that to this Ummah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give uh, us as, as believers, the strength and the wisdom and the foresight to look at what's going on in, in, uh, in, in Palestine and in Gaza and to see the, the kind of atrocities that, that, that they're being subjected to, the kind of demolition that they're being subjected to, for us to, uh, to use that as an opportunity to wake us up collectively as an ummah. And not just to be a voice for them and to do what we can to ease their suffering and to work towards the freedom uh, for our brothers and sisters in, in Palestine, but also beyond that, to figure out a way as an ummah and uh, to go back to the glory that we had in the past, not the kind of glory where you, uh, you, you, you overpower the entire world and you subjugate them to your will, but rather when you give them something that's lacking, a that higher purpose in life, that beauty that the Prophet wasallam, that the companions they brought to this world where it wasn't the power of the sword, but the, uh, the, uh, the meaning that they brought to people's lives. Where in places like Indonesia and Malaysia, Islam spread without any military uh, programs without any attacks without any any of that and, and no one in our history by and large was forced to convert because that's the uh, undeniable principle in this deen that there is no compulsion in religion la din. and so for us to be that example as an ummah collectively uh, to uh, so that we have that reason, so we have that beautiful presentation of what we have, that treasure that we have, that we can provide the world. This, this world today needs the, the values of Islam, the values of humility, of the universality, of compassion, all of these beautiful values that we have, that we know the Qur'an teaches us, that we know the example of the Prophet Wasallam teaches us, that's what the world needs, desperately. And so, uh, it's not something that's going to happen overnight, but nothing happened overnight even during the time of the Prophet ﷺ either. He had to struggle, the Sahaba, they struggled, 
And they were victorious even in defeat, even when they struggled, even when they went through hardships, because you see their efforts. We are part of the results and the fruits of their efforts. Part of the effort uh, of the Prophet wasallam in his da'wah is that today, in this part of the world, all of us are saying, La ilaha illallah. All of us are gathered here praying Jum'ah, saying, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. That's the power of the message. And our message has that power. But we just have to realize that, the, the kind of power that we have within our message, and that purification of this message from all of these other things, from uh, from hatred and animosity and all of those things that the Prophet wasallam he came to teach us that as believers it's unbecoming of you to have any of that. The Prophet wasallam he came to teach us to to help the poor and the needy. Right? Afshu salam to spread salam and peace and to greet people not just with your tongue but that peace that you can spread with your words and your actions and your deeds, all of that. That's part and parcel of who we are as believers. And that's the contribution that we can make wherever we may be. We may be very demoralized nowadays, but don't forget that it's not instant victories that, that, that happen all the time. Allah can do everything, of course. But the, the power of, of this message uh, is that Today you can be spreading it to just a few people in 10 years, 20 years. What you have done probably uh, will be the seeds for some great change that will happen. A people will be liberated because you contributed towards their liberation. A people will have, inshallah, Palestine will be free because part of the effort was me and you raising our voices. Part of it is, is me and you talking to our neighbors and humanizing the Palestinians. You know, the most uh, potent weapon that people use against those who they hate is to take away their humanity, change them into statistics and numbers and populations, but take away their humanity. They brush an entire society, an entire community, an entire nation with a broad brush of backwardness, of terrorism, of evil, of hatred, so on and so forth. That can so easily be undone at the individual level. When you can talk to people, when you can tell people stories of people who were, you know, fathers, mothers, children, students, sportsmen and women, uh, you know, involved, engaged in their community, doing beautiful things, and suddenly their lives were cut short. Every family that loses a loved one, sometimes entire families, there are no loved ones left, all of them are lost. They have stories, and those are the stories that we can tell, that we can relate, and that is so, so powerful to humanize them. And when you humanize people like the Palestinians, People like the Uyghurs, the Rohingya, you name it, whoever, there are, there are people who are being oppressed. When you humanize them, then it's hard for people, when they have heard those personal stories, it's hard for people to hear a boogeyman story and fall for it and say, yeah, they're all evil and they deserve to die. That's part of what we can do and can contribute, and inshallah, it may not have the desired effect today or tomorrow, but who knows, in a year, in a decade, we will have done something to change a, an entire nation's uh, destiny, insha'Allah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I say this word, and I thank you to the Muslims, and thank you to the Muslims, and thank you to the Muslims, and thank you to the Muslims. Alhamdulillah, wa ahdah, wa salatu wa salam, wa ala man la nabiyya ba'dah, وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله 
حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد واله وصحبه ومن تبعهم باحسان الى يوم الدين اللهم انصر الاسلام والمسلمين واعز الاسلام والمسلمين وانصر المستضعفين في كل مكان يا رب العالمين وانصر اخواننا واخواتنا المستضعفين في غزة وفي فلسطين يا رب العالمين اللهم انصرهم وفرج عليهم وكلهم ولا تكن عليهم يا رب العالمين اللهم انك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا واغفر لنا ولوالدينا ولمشائخنا ولجميع المؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات الاحياء منهم والاموات ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار برحمتك يا رحم الرحمين واقم الصلاة Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Salam Allah, ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, ayya Allah, ilaha illallah, ilaha illallah, ilaha illallah, ilaha illallah, ilaha illallah, ilaha illallah,